thanks for uh, coming by. Uh, I thought I would take the time up here to tell you about Hyperledger. It's a very different kind of organization than you typically would uh, see on a stage like this. Uh, uh, and so walk you through a little bit of like who we are and why we exist. Uh, maybe talk a bit about uh, some of the technology projects we have undergoing, uh, and then kind of invite you to get involved in those. So one thing that's important to understand about who Hyperledger is, is uh, we're a part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, and the Linux Foundation is an organization that's been around for about 15 years uh, and has sat at the center of initially just the Linux ecosystem and now increasingly a number of other related technology ecosystems. And what does it mean to sit at the center of an ecosystem like this? It means connecting two different types of communities, connecting developers who are working together on an operating system, working together on cloud computing software, working together on software that runs inside of automobiles like automotive grade Linux, uh, as well as uh, helping to bridge uh, the divide between companies in this space who, despite being vicious competitors all need to work together on common technology. And in fact, the reason why Linux has become uh, uh, embedded inside of everything from all 500 of the 500 top supercomputers in the world to every Android phone is that it's been able to be a neutral ground for the different companies involved to come together and work on the greatest amount uh, of uh, the greatest amount of technology that they can while still uh, competing on stuff that they build on top. It's about optimizing R&D spending to some degree, but it's also about saying, how do we build platforms that don't have to be owned just by one vendor or just by one company? Kind of a very similar thing to uh, the reason why we're interested in using blockchain technology, is it gives us a chance to build platforms and networks and deployments that aren't dependent upon a central 800-pound gorilla uh, inside of each of our industries. Um, and so uh, uh, Linux has been active in all these different domains. Uh, uh, we've, uh, really, if you put all the source code together, it represents the single largest collaborative intellectual property project the world has ever seen. Um, and Hyperledger specifically uh, was launched about two years ago. Uh, it was launched at a time when there was uh, a lot of uh, realization that this blockchain thing is potentially about more than just Bitcoin more than just any particular coin, more than about cryptocurrencies, there might be an application of these technologies to other, other types of use cases, right? And a real uh, kind of semantics question, well, is everything built on top of a coin? Well, we said, let's explore the other side of that. Could we look at this where coins are one kind of application, but there are others that are possible as well, and I'll walk you through that. Um, and since launch, uh, we've uh, delivered a, quite a bit of software. Uh, and uh, uh, we've got, uh, within the Hyperledger organization, 10 different software technology projects. Five of them are frameworks, tools like Hyperledger Sawtooth and Hyperledger Fabric, which you'll hear me talk more about. Um, and then five other tools that make using those easier for developers. Um, but fundamentally, we take the perspective, by the way, that we're not about building one ledger, one chain, one global system everyone feeds into and out of. We're about creating tools that allow groups of people to stand up their own networks, would allow 20 banks to stand up a network to do settlements between them, would allow 20 participants in a, uh, in a software supply chain or, or in, a, in any sort of supply chain or 200 or five uh, to do that and to use whatever governance model and combination of technology makes sense for them. So uh, uh, anyway, so, so back to the last two years. We also have wrapped a lot of uh, companies into these efforts. This isn't just an R&D project that a few people thought would be interesting over time. I'll show you some of the companies involved soon. Um, we've also reached and tapped into a tremendous vein of interest in this on the part of developers uh, all around the world. Uh, we've got over 100 cities now where there's active meetup communities, uh, thousands of people engaged in that, uh, and a lot of press awareness around what we're doing as well. Um, and starting even two years ago, uh, the companies that had been involved seemed a little unusual. They didn't seem like necessarily your typical kind of blockchain company, right? We had a few of those. We, uh, Digital Asset, for example, is a company started by Blythe Masters, um, focused on delivering DLT solutions to Wall Street. Um, but we've got a lot of other companies you've probably heard of, like Accenture and IBM and Hitachi. And in a way, these seem like you know the, the old guard trying to be hip again, right, uh, to dive into a blockchain project. But but really, they were the ones who also had real use cases that when they sat down and realized what was possible, said, we want to be in on that. And then companies you wouldn't expect to be part of any open source project, like Airbus or Daimler, uh, and other companies that reflect the geographic diversity of what's interesting to what we do, like um, Baidu uh, uh, and Wanda, who are two companies headquartered in mainland China. Uh, and, and, and other companies that represent sectors you might not have thought health, uh, that blockchain technology would apply to, like change healthcare, 
which is uh, a, a healthcare insurance claims management company that, who touch about 80% of the insurance claims in the, in the world. Uh, in the United States, sorry. Um, uh, but we've also brought a much larger contingent, way too many logos to show, of uh, uh, hundreds of companies who have bought into the idea that this is interesting technology that's worth supporting through a mix of financial support as well as developer contributions. Lots and lots of startups, lots of geographic diversity, uh, everybody from banks to, to tiny little companies in China focusing on bringing renewable energy credits to, uh, to, to, uh, to the Chinese energy markets, uh, all sorts of fun groups, as well as a bunch of associate members. Um, these are government organizations, uh, central banks like the Bank of England or Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, nonprofits uh, uh, who are in uh, the, the produce space and the real estate space, all sorts of fun, fun different organizations and quite a few universities as well. So to think conceptually about the problem that we solve and where we fit, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, kind of the two different uh, uh, dimensions to the landscape of blockchain technologies. Uh, one of those is uh, who can read this database, right? Is this blockchain a, uh, a public ledger or is it a private ledger? Uh, and then the second is who can write to this database? Uh, is, it, is it anybody can show up and stand up a node and participate in the consensus mechanism, as they call it? Uh, or is that something that's more permissioned based on uh, uh, you know, who you are or, uh, and, and agreeing to a set of uh, criteria and circumstances? And these are actually two independent things. Sometimes they're called private and public, but it really, really is worth thinking about kind of a two-way two -way matrix to this. And there's not a lot in one of those sectors, which is the permissionless and private uh, uh, bucket. Public polling maybe might go there. But um, when you think about things like land titles or university degrees uh, or other kinds of applications that are about public data, these are items that are probably going to be written using a permissioned ledger. Uh, and then when you think about other data sets that are much more sensitive, things like dealing with medical information, where even if we're not going to write uh, uh, sensitive medical data directly to a ledger, there might still be metadata, there might still be encrypted forms of this data there. And so having that, that as a private ledger kind of makes some sense. Um, or using that as a, as a place to conduct wires between banks, that sort of thing, right? Um, and so hyperledger technologies have tended to focus focus on permissioned entities, permissioned ledgers. Um, and the metaphor that I use for people is, you know, even in things like a, like, a, like, a, like a football game or some other sports game, we still have referees, right? We still have a sense of the rules. And we kind of all agree to the rules and we show up on the field, but if we didn't have a referee, somebody who was chartered with understanding, are the rules being followed? And even if they are being followed, are, is anybody ex showing uh, kind of, you know, unsportsmanlike behavior, right? Then that's probably a time to throw a yellow flag or even a red flag. Um, and by the way, the referee is accountable to the team. If you have a bad referee uh, and they start making bad calls or they charge people $100 to get on the, on the field or something, right, they'll probably be kicked out uh, for the next game. And so that's the kind of blockchain uh, applications that we're seeing, a, a map to existing uh, uh, networks, existing business relationships, and are becoming much more appealing to people to go out and deploy. Um, so within Hyperledger, we've got, as I mentioned, a, a, a 10 different technology projects. And I will quickly take us through uh, kind of an overview of what those are uh, and how people are using them. Uh, but just to kind of give you a conceptual model, five of them are what we would call frameworks. These are tools to be able to stand up a permission ledger, whether they're public facing or private facing. Um, uh, uh, as, and, and then also write smart contracts to run on, on, these, on these ledgers. And then five of them are tools to really help make adoption of these technologies easier. Um, so the kind of, you know, uh, uh, the first project that really hit a 1.0 production release that has received uh, probably the largest amount of collective uh, intellectual investment into it is Hyperledger Fabric. And Fabric is uh, a tool for building these distributed ledgers. Uh, uh, it is very similar to kind of other database style applications people might have seen, but uh, essentially have, uh, with essentially kind of a multi-master kind of notion to it, right? The ability to say I've got 20 different participants, anybody can write to this, everybody gets a full copy of the ledger, uh, and, and then we can automate useful bus pro business processes on top. Fabric has been the platform that's been used in over 400 different proofs of concepts, pilots, and a couple of dozen different production networks now are running on top of Fabric in healthcare, in finance, in a bunch of other domains. And I'll talk about a few. And there's a lot of sophistication that's gone into figuring out how do we make this, the, these kinds of systems run at scale. 
where you can support thousands of transactions per second across a heterogeneous network uh, to be able to handle some of the more intense use cases involved. Uh, and, and it's also got a lot of flexibility in the languages that you can use to program against, uh, as well as the ability to subset that network to get some degree of confidentiality between parties. So one of the first big deployments of this has been in the cross-border payment space. And uh, a, a, the company that comes to mind when one says cross-border payments is Swift, right? And for those of you who don't know much about Swift, they have kind of an interesting backstory. They're actually a co-op owned by their, the member banks uh, and, and are really just, initially they were focused on messaging, right? One bank being able to tell another bank in another country, I'm about to, to wire you some amount of money, right? Uh, for this account over there, from this account over here. And then there'd be this multi-day reconciliation process between the ledgers of those two different organizations to make sure that, you know, that amount of value is actually transferred, and then for everybody to settle out after a week or a month, that's, that sort of thing. But that's why it would take three days, often for a bank wire to be considered closed, is this multi-step reconciliation process. Using a distributed ledger, using Fabric, actually, they're able to get that uh, settlement time from three days to five minutes because the ledger is considered the, uh, the, the system of record in these kinds of transfers now and can sit in and, and pretty much change Swift from being about a messaging system to becoming a settlements layer. So that's pretty awesome. They've been working with this code. It's in late stage pilot now and hopefully they'll go into production this year or next. Um, similarly, there's a network of other organizations that have been, uh, has been stood up, other banks predominantly, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, um, Santander, a bunch of others, to implement a trading network for uh, uh, trade finance, uh, sorry, a, a financial network for trade finance. Everything from, you know, the origination of an order to the issuing of invoices to a letter of credit to actually clearing everything out and closing, uh, uh, basically automating all those processes that in the best of circumstances meant a lot of paperwork, a lot of faxes, a lot of humans involved in the process of clearing that payment and getting to, getting to completion. Uh, by doing this in real time, they're able to stamp out not just uh, a lot of the delay, but a lot of the mistakes that are made in the financial process uh, and, and bring a degree of automation and monitor, monitoring to it that should cut the cost of doing business uh, around the globe. Uh, but an example I love giving, really, is the diamond industry's use of this to implement something called the Kimberly process, which is a, uh, a process for uh, keeping conflict diamonds out of the supply chain. Uh, this was, a you could call it a political agreement, uh, but it was really a traceability uh, and process agreement they came to 15 years ago. Uh, but at that time, the best tools that they could think of to deploy were faxing or, or transmitting over email uh, uh, records of, hey, this, this diamond arrived from somebody, here's its characteristics, here's the ID that I'm told it's associated with, uh, and then we've received it and send that notification onward, maybe stamp a paper certificate that came with that diamond uh, and follows it as it goes hand to hand. And these are all processes that are ripe for corruption, ripe for mistake, uh, and really hard for people in that chain to validate the provenance because a stamp is a stamp, and who knows if they've actually reported it to the right authorities, right? Um, by moving to a distributed ledger, the participants in the diamond industry, and they have on board everybody from the mines to the uh, aggregators and the shippers to the people who refine this to, to the retail sector, everybody in that chain will be able to prove that this given diamond here came from these, these many hops all the way back to a known good source, right? A place that hasn't been involved in blood diamonds, a place where, you know, those diamonds weren't being used to buy weapons, that sort of thing. Um, and so, uh, my battery's running low. Uh, uh, and so, uh, this Kimberly process, until it had been moved to a ledger, didn't have really a way to guarantee trust and integrity in the system. Uh, since running it in a uh, uh, late stage pilot, they've caught millions of dollars worth of fraud. They already have millions of diamonds in this system. And they plan to move this to, to full-time production this year, which means at some point down the road, if you're buying a diamond and somebody can't prove to you in a way that you can verify with an app or uh, somehow independently actually came from a known good source, then you shouldn't buy it, right? Just like you wouldn't buy a car or a house from somebody who couldn't prove that they had title to those objects either. Um, Sawtooth is another platform. It's, uh, it's kind of comparable to uh, Fabric in the same way that in the database world you have MySQL and Cassandra. And these are very different databases, even if to most of you in the room they just sound like databases. If you're a developer, you know that one is really about uh, acid compliance and, and transactional coherence, and the other is about eventual consistency and massive scale. 
Well, likewise, these two are, are two different platforms with different performance characteristics, different features that they expose. Um, the uh, Sawtooth in particular has a different consensus mechanism called proof of elapsed time, which is somewhat like the Bitcoin proof of work in its ability to fan out to a large number of devices uh, and be a fair leader election in deciding who puts the next link in the chain. Uh, I, but I, 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 so there's some interesting characteristics to it. Um, Sawtooth, when it uh, hit 1.0, is also the first Hyperledger project to support the running of Ethereum smart contracts. Uh, uh, and we thought that was really cool. Uh, uh, and that's work uh, with integration with another project called Hyperledger Burrow. Uh, and here uh, it's being deployed or is in the process of being deployed for a seafood supply chain traceability project, which is very similar to the diamond one. There's a big problem in the seafood industry with fish that are caught out of quota or caught using fleets that aren't certified and actually do involve slave labor. Um, uh, and a, a problem as well with you know, what's claimed to be tuna or claimed to be snapper not actually being either of those fish. And so implementing a supply chain traceability process that also includes the integration of IoT data, secure sensor data, into that same ledger will help attest to the integrity and veracity of a claim that, say, the salmon you're buying in the store is wild-caught salmon or sustainably f fished or any of those kinds of claims. Um, it's also being used by another project called Dot Blockchain, which is tracing media and music rights sort of as an alternative to the very opaque and very uh, unfair systems that we use today to compensate uh, uh, people who write music. Uh, uh, it basically goes into a black box held by ASCAP, BMI, those sorts, and then those entities cut a check. Um, and there's not much visibility for the artists in terms of am I getting a fair share of the revenue being generated by my music by recording that data into a public ledger and recording it using uh, a permissioned entity, uh, permission network uh, the way that Sawtooth sets up. I, I, hopefully we can take that process and make it much more transparent to the outside world. Um, there's a couple of different ledgers in the interest of time. I'll kind of walk through these quickly. There's one that came from some of our members in Japan called Aroha. A bunch of different characteristics, but it's being used by the uh, National Bank of Cambodia uh, for a national currency project of all things, uh, as well as by Sampo Holdings for a weather derivatives management system. I mean, some crazy applications of this stuff. Um, but some of the projects I get most excited about, uh, uh, here's one, Hyperledger Indy. So we all know that identity is broken on the internet. We all know that you know, this idea of your, who you are, your profile being stored on a remote server makes about as much sense as going off to pay your taxes by logging with Facebook or logging with Twitter, right? That would be a mistake if we allowed it to get that far. Um, and so a bunch of people have been working on an alternative to the way that identity works on the net called self-sovereign identity. And Hyperledger Indy is the software support infrastructure for this new kind of inverted identity network where rather than you being defined by your profile in all these different places, you are defined by digital objects and information you have close to you in a wallet that then you share information about and record who you share that information with to a distributed ledger. And so some really exciting work going on here. It's part of a collaborative with a bunch of other both for-profit and non-profit organizations. Uh, and there's applications all over the map, but one that's going live this year that we're excited about is a KYC project with the six largest banks in the Philippines uh, who are using, will be using this to essentially make it possible when you open an, an account at one bank to get a loan, for example, you can bring your financial history from another bank in with you, use that to apply for the loan, and if you don't get approved, you can pull your information back. It doesn't remain sitting on their servers uh, and, and in, a, in a state where you don't really have access to or know what it's about. If this works, this will actually uh, form the basis for a national ID system that unlike Aadhaar, uh, which is the national ID system of India, uh, or the way that other people have been implementing it, would be much harder to abuse as a, as a privacy invasive kind of big brothery kind of system. So this is a way, I think, to get us out of, out of that kind of uh, 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 situation. Um, Hyperledger Burrow is the fifth of these frameworks. I mentioned it previously with Sawtooth. This is an implementation of the Ethereum virtual machine, uh, which is smart contracts you might hear about there running on the Ethereum uh, mainnet. This is a way to take them and run them on permission ledgers. Uh, on top of Sawtooth for now, uh, as well as built into Burrow is, um, is support for running it on a Tendermint consensus mechanism. Um, but we'll be bringing that to Fabric pretty soon as well. Uh, and all of this is about sending a message as well that there's a lot of different 
different standards out there, a lot of different efforts out there. Um, the Ethereum community is coming up with some great software, and there are ways to use that technology in a way that doesn't tie you to the use of the token itself, which is, is I think, a pretty important point. In the interest of time, I'm gonna breeze through <laughs> some of the other tools that we have, but there's something called Composer, which is like a high-level IDE for building blockchain applications. Uh, we have another one called Quilt, which is a tool for connecting blockchains to each other. So if I've got two different ledgers uh, that I wanna do a transaction across, I wanna buy a house with Bitcoin, I can use this tool to conduct both transactions, either have them both succeed or both fail, right? Really important stuff. So what does this mean for a crowd like you that might be really focused on kind of more the investment side of this, more the business application side of this, and really wrestling with what does this mean around ICOs and tokens and things like that? I think predominantly it means you, there are ways to use these technologies that don't require an ICO, don't require a token. None of these examples I gave required an ICO. Uh, uh, these are all ways to, to build these networks of interest between companies, between parties, where there's intrinsic value driving the consensus mechanism and driving the utility you get out. Uh, and there's a lot of people experimenting that with this today. Uh, I'll end also by saying we've got a course that we put up on edX called Introduction to Blockchain Technology. Uh, partly it's about helping you understand how to use Fabric and Sawtooth, but the first half of that course is all business level. Here's what it means to be talking about DLT, distributed ledgers, on the enterprise. Uh, we've had 80,000 people sign up to take this course so far, uh, and I would welcome all of you to do that as well. So thank you very much.